Good morning. I'm Mike Mackey, uh, pastor of Schofield Bible Fellowship. Our desire each Sunday is to focus on God's point of view. And uh, this morning, I'd like to start with uh, our notes on If you look at the notes, it's page one, it says born again on the top. Put it up here on the board as well, on the screen. Thanks, Chris. All right. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, that's fine too. But we got all the verses here we should need. I wanted this morning just to remind us of being simple with the unbeliever. Uh, we can look at the gospel. And we can see all the different elements of it because we've studied about it and we've been, been challenged by it and we're encouraged by it and we love it. However, the unbeliever is dead spiritually. He needs to be born again. He's alive physically and he has the ability to take in information. However, his ability to understand what's going on needs the new birth. And so it's real easy for us to not keep it simple. And here is a religious leader, Nicodemus, that comes to Jesus by night. And he is really uh, concerned about understanding who Jesus Christ is. And uh, you know, what's he about? He's trying to figure him out. And uh, he uses the uh, the plural there, so which I believe so what he's talking about is that he's representing other men that, that, that were on the Sanhedrin. When it says he's a ruler of the Jews, that means he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. Uh, uh, the religious life in Jerusalem, this was authorized by the king that it was okay with the Roman government that they would do this. And so they could do a number of things. Uh, we won't go into that. But I'd just like you to understand the situation that Jesus is facing here. Um, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we'll cover these Verse seven verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus was a member of the religious group called the Pharisees. There were at that time in Israel, three religious groups that ruled the religious life of Israel. And I'll just give you a, a brief resume of uh, what they were a little bit about. The Pharisees were a conservative group. They believed that the scriptures were meant to be interpreted literally. However, they followed the Mosaic law and also religious oral traditions that had been added to the law. So you find the Lord Jesus in the gospels often criticizing the Pharisees because what often was a tradition that they had added on. So some scribe said sometime in the past and they passed on this information that the, this extra in, information was contradicting what the scriptures were saying. 
And so he wanted them to get back to the scriptures. And so that's one of the main contentions that Jesus faced was dealing with those that were actually the closest to the truth, comparatively speaking, than the other two groups. Um, but sometimes uh, being close to the truth is a problem because it's still not the truth. And the truth makes you free. The second group is called the Sadducees, and they were a more liberal group. They denied the resurrection of the dead, the existence of spirits, and the obligation to oral traditions. So they had their, they, they cut the traditions out, that's true, but they cut out some other things as well. They emphasized accepting uh, of the written law of Moses. What I did miss there, uh, they didn't believe in any afterlife. So you just lived, and so it's doing the best you could do in life now, and they took the Mosaic law as a means of living out a good quote-unquote life. The third group is the Herodians. And these individuals would connect with King Herod a lot of times, I'm sure, as far as uh, their viewpoint, because they were a political Jewish group who wanted the restoration of the Herodian uh, dynasty to the throne of Judea. So they wanted that system in place. The ruling body, and uh, it's a little complicated. I'm not gonna go into the details of trying to explain this. There's actually two different bodies, a larger body, a great one and a small one. And they had different numbers and different ones. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of complicated. But the, the Sanhedrin was a ruling body made up of select members from the previous three groups. And they were all represented on the, the board, as it were, of the controlling group of the religious life of Israel. Verse two, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So one thing I would like to point out is number two here, came to Jesus by night. There's a lot of speculation as why he came by night. Maybe he was just a very busy man and didn't have any other time in his schedule. However, speaking to the Lord Jesus was quite easy. He was a very public person. And so if Nicodemus wanted to talk to him um, in the daytime, there would have been plenty of access to that. However, he chose to come by night. So best case scenario, I would say, Nicodemus was coming by night, indicated he wanted a more private meeting with Jesus. And notice uh, Nicodemus didn't question the authenticity of Jesus' miracles. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can, can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he was not questioning, as some were questioning the miracles. He recognized they were from God. And so he said that you got to be from God. So, uh, you know, I'm a little bit confused here. So, Help me out. And I, I, I thought they would probably, he probably thought we'd get into some theological discussion or whatever. But this is what Jesus answers him right from the get go, verse three. And he explains why. I was doing a little study this uh, week on the word C A S E E E and the different words that are translated 
to look to see <laughs> and comparing them. And I, the, the word here, Edo, in the perfect tense, we know that it means to know. It means like no eternal life. These things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, you may know. In the perfect tense, means to be totally aware of this, you know it. But the ba base word, Edo, uh, expresses your mere mechanical, passive, or casual vision. I thought that was very interesting. He said, uh, he makes a statement. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You really don't understand what I'm talking about until you're alive. You really don't get it. So what I'm more concerned about in our conversation here, I, I, what I want you to do is be born again. And if you're born again, you're going to get what I'm driving at. And so talking religious things with people is very shallow in the relationship. You want to get to the point where you're talking about being born again, explaining how to be born again. So that's our goal. And so that was the Lord Jesus's goal in this conversation. Verse four. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? So, so he's trying to logically assess the statement. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so he's thinking of a flesh birth. He's thinking of being born from his mother. So the, the natural use of the word birth is used here. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he's, he says, now if you wanna enter the kingdom of God, you need a second birth. Verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So he says the water birth here is a flesh birth. And when you think of the word water, you might think of oh, when the baby is being born, the water breaks. So that's a flesh birth. The flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is in the realm of the spirit. So he indicates you need a change internally. You need to be fixed. In your mind, in the spirit part of your mind. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So the last point this morning, number four, born of the flesh, being born a Jew had more importance to him. So his physical birth was a major thing in a Jew's mind. They were born to the children of Israel. And so they, would, they clung to that idea of their relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were of the children of Israel. But he says, that's not enough. Now remember, this is before the church exists, all right? So he's not talking to him about the church. That is a mystery to yet be revealed. So what is he talking to him about? Him, he's talking about Israel accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. But much more than that, as we will look at next week, that he's emphasizing that he would understand that he is God. Because without that, the, the message is incomplete. 
accepting as a Messiah is one thing. And there were many individuals who were becoming disciples of the, of the Lord Jesus uh, because they believed he had potentially the ability to be the Messiah. But what they needed to see also is that he is the Son of God. And we'll look at that more. But the point here that I'd like for us to notice here in point four. Born of the flesh, being born a Jew, had more importance to him, and born of the spirit, a spirit, a birth in the human spirit, are necessary to enter the kingdom of God. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And so he says, <clears throat> answer this religious man's approach to him by issue making an issue of the new birth as the issue and that's when we get into conversations that should be our objective should we pause for prayer heavenly father we thank you so much for today we thank you for all that you provide us but most of all we want to thank you for providing us salvation from condemnation that we can know that we have eternal life we can know that we are children of god and as children of god we have a relationship with you that goes beyond just birth but a whole eternal life to live and the question comes up in our minds, are we enjoying the life that you have? We have blessed assurance, but are we submitting to the life that you have and have us to live? And bringing everything, praising you all the day long for all the different things that you want to challenge our minds about, that we would enjoy the grace of God and has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works which you have before ordained that we shall walk in them. So not only are we saved by grace, but we have a life to live by grace. I just pray that you would just help us to enjoy this message today as we look at uh, Daniel's concern to confess. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now look at page six. All righty. We're looking at verse 10 of the ninth chapter. I, I'd like for us to go to this, the scriptures here, read the context again. It's good for us. Dr. Toonstro, when I was going to school in Grand Rapids, Michigan, he was always encouraging us, read the context, read the context. And uh, he assigned that you have to read it three times, but he was always pushing for more. So. 
So you'll only understand it as you read it over and over again. So the spirit has something to work with here. So let's go to um, in our, our Bible law here. Go to the New King James. goes Daniel chapter 9. And what had caused him to be praying now, and, and he's confessing the sins of not only himself, but all for the nation of Israel. He had come across a prophecy. And look at it in verse 2. It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish, that would finish, 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So the 70 years of disciplinary action against Israel was going to be coming to an end after 70 years it is believed that he was that Daniel was about 66 years old and so he's looking forward to the future in Israel preparing their heart for that time so he had some time on his hands so what can he do and so he started praying and going on uh, and praying on behalf of Israel, admitting to, uh, to, the, to the God their failure. And so we see in verse three, then I set my face toward the Lord God. So he said, he zeroed in. I'm just going to be just occupied with the Lord right now, set apart some time here just to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Those are things that um, a person in those days would prove that they were really serious about something. They changed their diet, their dress, and uh, their physical appearance. And, that meant, I'm really serious about this. All right. Verse four, and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. So he said, do you keep your part of the bargain all the time? However, you want to bless and can only use people that are doing, are keeping his commandments. And so they were on the Mosaic law. They had not only the rules and regulations, 613, but much of that was occupied with sacrifice. And that was a reminder that an innocent victim had to pay for their sins. And this was happening over and over again. So that God says, I want you to be remembering that you're a sinner. And that I'm going to send a savior. Verse five. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. Even by departing from your precepts. In your judgments, we're not, we know of these truths, but we don't do them. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and to the people of the land. So then, well, there's the problem with we, God, send men to warn them 
and to try to get them on the right track. But you wouldn't listen to them either. Verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongeth to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and those far off in other countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness that uh, which they have committed against you. Verse eight, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. The very thorough confession of sin. To the Lord our God belongeth mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Now, I just, this is a verse we're going to be looking at examining, verse 10. Uh, if you would take the time to read this prayer, it's not going to take very long. But it looked like what Daniel was ready to, well, as long as it took in talking to God, he was going to uh, plead him for an answer. Uh, that, that shows an attitude. Are we serious about our walk with God? And so what we, we can be like Daniel, be serious, and approach God the way God wants to be approached. Well, he wanted to be approached by, in the Old Testament, in reminding them of their sinfulness and the need of a Savior with the sacrificial system of the Mosaic law. That was the right thing for them to be doing. That's not the right thing for us to be doing, however. Let's go to our notes now. Verse 10, top of the page. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. So this takes it a, a step further. I said, we're not interpreting whether it's coming from the prophets or whatever. We're not being serious that this is God who we are arguing with. This is God who we are, we are ignoring. It's God who we are sinning against. Daniel confessed, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws. Voice is used here to look beyond the person reminding them about scripture and focusing on that, on what God is saying to them. Daniel chapter 9 verses 11 and 12. Yes, all Israel had has transgressed your law and has departed so as to not obey your voice. God is speaking to you through the scriptures. He's challenging your thinking. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? He said Israel is not doing that. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him, against God. Verse 12, and he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, 
and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. So the 70 years of disaster that is predicted to be to come out upon Israel but was because of that condition of heart. For under the whole heaven, such as has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. So two points, because they did not obey God's voice, the curse and oath written in the law of Moses was being poured out on Israel. And number two, God has confirmed his word, bringing a great disaster. So there's things that went with that. Not only were they, uh, their temple worship stopped and they're a prisoner of another nation, but he's pointing out that the desolation uh, in the Jerusalem area and the being scattered into the far corners of the world from different countries of the Jewish people. Okay, how do, what, what do we learn from this? What's the thing for our day? We today, we must realize that just because we are under grace doesn't mean that God doesn't discipline. Doesn't discipline his children in love as he stated in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, not to fall short of the grace of God. A good chapter to read is the 12th chapter as it, em it emphasizes the point of being disciplined. First of all, let's look at what we have here in our, on our notes here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through seven. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So who's the witnesses here? Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah, Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter before, chapter 12. And he's pointing out Old Testament believers. So they are the witnesses of God's faithfulness. So they had encountered God and the importance of obedience was brought into play here. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, you may not think it's important because you've got a strong back, you know, you can handle it, right? Nope. He said, the weight here is that he said, what happens here is you're a real basic little pr uh, principle. You start carrying weight, you're going to keep on adding weight. That's what's going to happen. Now, we're not trying to be weightlifters here. He said, no, I want you to cast all your cares. Let's um, go to. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five. He's talking about the church here. Begin, begin with verse one. 
The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over them, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that shall not fade away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. We're a body. We're meant to be working together. And no, notice how you're Oh, we're all supposed to be clothed. So we're kind of, we're not sackcloth and ashes. Clothed with humility. The humility here is before God. Uh, there's religious humility that's emphasized as, you know, just you know, beating yourself up. Uh, making yourself seem very low on the totem pole of life. That's not the point. He explains what kind of humility he's talking about in the last part of verse five. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, what does he say there? Casting how many? All of them. So that when we add a weight, we're in violation of the principle. We figure we can handle it. Casting all your cares. Now you're not throwing them away. You're just giving them to the Lord. Show me what to do with this stuff. He wants us to be caring. But not burdened with care. There's a difference. You're working as a team with God. Okay, oh Lord, here's this problem. Okay, well, what do you want me to do about it? Let me know. And I have to do some thinking, some praying, some searching of the scriptures, maybe, finding out truths that would relate to the, this so that I would get God's voice in the vault here, coming from the scriptures. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he can get you out from beneath the, the weight, uh, that he may exalt you in due time, that you get past the dealing with the, the cares, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Then he says in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. So be thinking. You're not trying to, you know, say, I cast all my cares on the Lord, so I just block them out of my thinking. No. The word sober means to be thinking. Thinking seriously. Be on guard. Be vigilant. Be ready for action. Be ready to do what God would have you to do with that situation. Because your adversary, the devil, walked about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so by being sober and being vigilant, we are resisting him.
if we don't take the time to cast our cares upon him, to be sober, to be vigilant, what happens is we open ourselves up to other problems. And in, Peter says, what you're opening yourself up to is being batted around by Satan here. <laughs> and he just discouraged you and you can, all kinds of uh, problems you can be facing, which are not mentally healthy, not physically healthy, and you are shortchanging yourself in your walk with God. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And I like this prayer here in verse 10. But may the God of all grace, unmerited favor, who calls us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Back to our notes. All righty. What did I do that for? There you go. Oh. <clears throat> So lay aside every weight and the sin, and I believe this is referring to the sin nature, right? There's a definite article there in the Greek. Let us lay aside every weight and lay aside the sin nature. And what's interesting is that he is like the... the in the illustration that's going on, he's using is he's using an illustration of a racing, being in a race, and he's saying the sin nature is your competitor, and you can get occupied with trying to get ahead of your sin nature. You're trying to battle that. You're trying to battle your sin nature instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You let the Lord take care of the sin nature. You walk in the spirit and he will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So let's look at it and read that again here. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside the weight and the sin. We shouldn't be carrying anything. So we're, we can run the race efficiently. Uh, he's carrying it for you. And the, and the sin nature, the competitor, which so easily ensnares us. It distracts us from what we're supposed to be doing, which is, and let us run with endurance we're running in a way that we can finish the race, the endurance of the race that is set before us. Verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author, the beginning of the, of the race, and the finish line 
of the race. He is studying the race. We begin at the point of our salvation. And how are we doing? Are we even on the uh, on the even the right road after a while, huh? <laughs> So we're robbing ourselves of joy, of having really life fulfillment, and, and attaining the things that really are good for us, and the, and the blessings that God had stored up for us, and we're just bypassing that because we're running on some back road here uh, off of the boondocks. Now, when you've done that, the Lord's going to, because I've done it. <laughs> you may go through a little point, a little a bit of uh, um, difficult travel. Say, Lord, I, you say, Lord, I, I confess. I've sinned against you. I want to be on the right, the right track here. Well, in order for us to get back on the right track, we have to take a shortcut. And sometimes the shortcuts are not very much fun. And so we got to keep our heads screwed on the street. The good times are coming. But you, you, because as much we're saying, as Lord, correct me. And uh, our sin nature will be telling us, oh, no, you don't need that. You don't need that correction. No. That gets you just off, off on a tangent, you know. So stick to it. And he gives the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ as illustration. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the faith for the race. It's the, the object lesson is finishing the race in the illustration here. Who for the joy that was set before him? So we need to focus on rejoicing in the Lord always. All on the principle, all things are working together for good. Romans 8:28. All things are working together for good and uh, loving you. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And so he said, this is, an, <laughs> I, I see the joy I had, but in order for me to get to the joy I had, I have to go through this terrain for the, for the sake of the whole human race to offer them eternal life as a gift of God. So he endured so we need to run with endurance like him, going through difficult terrain, things that are not pleasant, so that we might get to the joy. A joy that is so good and so special and so fulfilling that nothing else compares to it. Endures the cross, despising. And that means not thinking of. These are the kind of things you're free to put it out of your mind. If you want to put something out of your mind, this is what you put out of your mind. Despising the shame, the consequences of, of <laughs> enduring the cross, there's some things that went along with that that weren't very pleasant. But he sees through that aside, I, that's worth it. The, the joy is worth it. 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 So I can take, I can just lay that aside out. It's like water of a duck. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's, we're going to, we can do the same thing mentally in our daily walk. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2.
beginning of verse one. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. The word course is the word aeon, which is age. The age of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's referring to Satan, it's Satan's world, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh. So when we're operating fleshly, like the unbelievers operate, in principle, we're doing the will of Satan. Our objective is doing the will of God. So we need to reject this whole system. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and whereby nature children of wrath just as others. But what happened? But God who was rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Verse six. So positionally, where are we right now? We're up there positionally. We're seated. We're raised up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're winners. We are positionally victorious. He's just saying, let this victory be applied to you in today, in this moment. And then the next one. Just live moment by moment, focused, with blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. that we are enjoying submitting ourselves to this salvation plan that God has provided us. By grace, you have been saved. Verse six, and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it has a future. This is some of the joy, okay? that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And we know if we are willing to walk in the spirit, we will not fill lusts of the flesh. And there is reward then, which are, is a glorifying of his grace. And according to verse seven, that in the ages to come, he might show off the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that's the joy that's set before us. We will look back and just thanking for every, the, the Father for every moment we walk, walk in fellowship. Every minute would be spent walking with him, doing it his way not carrying the burden ourselves, but casting that care upon him and allowing his will to be done in the life situation we were in. Every minute, every second, then that will be rewarded. The rest will be gone, wasted, worthless. We want our lives to come. So he says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Blessed, and you have that, it's yours. But verse 10, for we are his workmanship. 
However, he's designed us and he's made us that we're capable of running this race that's set before us. We have all that we need to be successful in running the race. That's not a problem. There's an answer for every situation you're going to encounter in your life. You walk the will of God, you're going to have the problems that God wants you to have. And there'll be solutions to those problems when you have them. And you'll go through that process of giving the way to the Lord. And you're going to be thinking you're sober. You're, you're thinking it's through. You're occupied with just solving, well, allowing God to solve these problems in, that you're facing. Which God prepared beforehand. God who knows the future, he knows exactly what he's going to face this afternoon. The question is, are we going to trust him? with everything in our lives, knowing that all things are working together for good to them that are loving God. So let the love flow toward God through you all the time, all the time. All righty, back to our notes. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, of this race, faith, the faith race, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising, not thinking of the shame, and have sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him. You run the race the same way he ran his race. We can do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Yes, there'll be tough times. Lest you become weary and discouraged. That word discouraged is translated faint in the King James Version. Uh, How do you become weary? Looking to the world. Yeah, you're carrying the weight. Yeah. You're carrying the weight. It goes right back to the beginning, beginning of the chapter. You're not supposed to carry the weight. You become weary because you're carrying the weight that you're not supposed to be carrying. So how can you run the race when you got this huge thing on your back that you put on there? You're the one, you, you didn't. You could have cast it on the Lord, but you didn't. And now you're singing the blues because of the weight. We are our own worst enemy. <laughs> And this in turn causes a collapse. And we try to find a, a, the wrong solution to it, unfortunately. Discouraged in your souls. Souls for the purpose of evaluating life down here. You're, you become a very soulish individual. You focus on your circumstances. You're not looking by faith ahead on the other side and making a plan to enjoy what's coming in from God into your life. You have, you have not yet resist, excuse me, resisted bloodshed, striving against sin, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. 
and you may want to, if you notice, if I go, if you, uh, in verse 6, of whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I put the word trains. All right. The word chastening may have a very negative connotation. It means to train. God is training you. So if you're going to be in a race, you have to go into training, maximizing your muscles, being the person that God would have you to be for the race that he has set before you. So our, how's our spiritual muscles? Are we being trained by God? How to be strong enough spiritually? Do we learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit for our energy source? Walking in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're taking God's solution, or are we going to try to handle our flesh by ourselves? So it says, You have not forgotten the exhortation which I speak unto you as, as to sons. My son, do not despise the training of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. He points something out that you're doing wrong. That's important for us to be aware of what we do is that's wrong by him. For whom the Lord loves, he trains and scourges every son whom he receives. This is taken from Proverbs chapter 3. Let's go to, to but we have time here yet. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. I always want to go in the wrong place here. Proverbs chapter 3. Starting with verse 1. Now, in the place of law here, we would put grace. Right? My son, do not forget my grace, but let your heart keep my grace. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck, write them on the tables of your heart. And so find favor and esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It'll be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Uh, the word flesh here in the Hebrew means your navel. So how was a baby fed? So it's being fed, it's, it's getting your body fed. It'll be healthy to your body and strength to your bones. You're getting nourishment from God. So he says, the word of God is like spiritual food. And you're taking in the word of God and it's creating energy. It's giving you motivation. It's encouraging. It's challenging. It's correcting. Uh, you can be a little more efficient if you do it this way. Well, okay. Verse nine. 
Honor the Lord with all your possessions. Does everything that you have belong to him? It's at his disposal. Well, however you want this used, it's yours, Father. With the first fruits of all your increase, when you do that, then the Lord is going to give you what you need. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening, the training of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, but as a father the son in whom he delights. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her. Proceeds are, be processes are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things that are made that main desire cannot can be compared to her. Length of days in her right hand, in her left hand, riches of an honor. Her ways are made of pleasantness and, her, and all her paths are peace. And spike, the, the, the subject matter here is wisdom. So you're getting wisdom from God, the right way to live by running this race that's set before us. Okay, let's go back to our notes. Oh. <clears throat> All right, verse seven in closing. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Train. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to get you on the right road running the race he set before you. It's a bright path. It's, it's, it's that, that race is made for you. That course that he has for you. Every situation he says, I'm providing you the training so you're ready for that, that next hill. Shall we pray? Father, Daniel wanted Israel to, Israel to be prepared after 70 years of discipline, of training, to really being trained well and accepting the training so that they could run the race on the other side of discipline they could finish the course that God has for them. And we today face the same scenario. Uh, we can't do a thing about yesterday, but we can do something about today, this moment and the next. Help us, Father, to accept your correction. Help us, Father, remind us, bring these verses to mind that you love us and you only correct us for our, our betterment and that you want to set before us joy
may we learn how to rejoice in the Lord always. That every circumstance contains something that has that quality of joy in it. And all things are working together for the good that you intend. Father, that's what we want. Praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.